Great. Great. So good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we continue with the theme of type of failure because you know we believe it's really going to be something that we see more often. Uh, and so we really want you to get you know a lot of perspectives um, on how we're going to be managing this new phenomenon. We, when for your interest, we had Janari with us recently, who shared a lot of his benchtop data, which you've seen from his papers. You know, but we also need to talk about the more practical aspects in your know, surgery versus um, you know transcatheter options and how feasible they, how feasible they're going to be. So we're really lucky to have a good friend, Vinny Bappert who's the chair of cardiothoracic surgery at Minneapolis Heart. <clears throat> Vinny has been a leader in structural heart, for those of you who don't know Vinny. Um, he's involved in many first in human. He's helped us develop a lot of techniques. And I credit you, Vinny, for a lot of what I know about Valve in Valve comes from you and from your, your two apps, uh, and now a third app, I guess. Uh, which are, I mean, me and my team consult every day when we we eval evaluating cases, and it's been extremely impactful. So thank you for taking the time to spend an hour of your time with us before your surgery. Uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much, Azim, and thanks for the opportunity as well. And you're absolutely right. I think we have been sitting on this for too long, and. Uh, uh, you know, I think it's just better to engage in this proactively rather than uh, put it on back burner. Uh, these are my disclosures. I work with most of the valve industries, uh, mainly to do research and et cetera on valve designs. I'm just going to recap very quickly uh, for those who are too young. Uh, you know, we know that <clears throat> the concept of TAVR was started by Dr. Anderson and then Dr. Kribier around 21 years ago, 22 years ago, did the first uh, in human. And then what we saw in Europe, and Azim will remember it better, we saw an explosion of multiple devices. And uh, this is a 2016 landscape where these many devices were uh, you know, C marked. Uh, these devices were designed for various reasons. Uh, some of them were designed so in early days, we used to struggle with positioning. Uh, our CT analysis was, didn't exist that time. Uh, there were designs which used to try and you know clip the wall, and many of these designs were transapical as well. Uh, there were other challenges like PV, uh, you know, leak, and you can see that the current all the tower designs have you know external skirt, and of course we have repositionable, recapturable devices. All this becomes a bit relevant a bit later, and hence I just wanted to quickly go through in the first five minutes on some steps. Uh, we worked hard on cerebral protection. You know, as you know, the Sentinel trial, although not conclusively positive, uh, it's a device which is commonly used in practice as well. Uh, we had really good data on early durability, five years, even more. And I think uh, this convinced all of us, you know, that it's actually working better than expected by many. And that probably included most of my surgical community as well. Um, very low mortality, as you see, you know, and TAVR essentially uh, became, you know, a day-to-day -day procedure. And as you know, today, nearly 950 centers in U.S. alone are doing TAVR procedures. 2010, high-risk inoperable patients, 2018, intermediate risk patients, and by 2020, we're treating all low-risk patients as well. And so the writing is on the wall. And uh, as we know that the curves of, you know, Taver have already uh, crossed the curves of Saver. Uh, in essence, essentially, if a patient comes to our clinic today, patient can choose if he or she is above 65 uh, to have a Taver. And I think it's right because there's a class one indication for that. There were other parallel developments, and we kind of got engaged in all this. Uh, high risk, low, intermediate risk, low risk, durability, PV leak. Uh, Val in Val was developing on the same side. And as you know, the tower for biker speed as well. Now, why I'm showing this? With Val in Val, we realized there are some unique issues. And these unique issues were what size second valve we're going to use. Till now, we were focused on native valves, and now we were suddenly changing in terms of something which is man-made. Uh, where do we land the valve? Uh, if it's less, you know, Russian doll phenomena. Uh, we learned a lot from Val in Val, which was nearly started in 2010. 
And on the other hand, for bicuspid patients who tend to be slightly younger for sure, we are learning a lot that some anatomies, towers don't expand particularly well. And these patients for sure are going to come back with, with degeneration. So we started talking about lifetime management. And majority of the theme, uh, if I'm being honest, lifetime management was all to do with, can you do a biological wall in a patient and then do a wall in wall? And I think that's where, you know, most of us were focused is, can you give a patient an option for a mechanical wall? And I think lifetime management, essentially, the theme was developed around that topic. Uh, we see these extremely complex charts uh, in good heart teams. We try and apply it. But as you know very well, you know, patient preference is also important. And more importantly, I think we still are unclear about relative risks of multiple procedures. So this will keep evolving in the future. We started talking about, you know, which valve we should use. So TAV is being used now for a very long time. So should there be what? first valve we should use. And again, the focus of the conversation was about commissural alignment, coronary access, gradients, durability to a point. But I think the majority of the discussion was focused on you know, new designs in terms of coronary access. But the biggest elephant in the room, which we all forgot actually, is, is durability of tower. And this is Dr. Anis Kivshaili, and I'm 100% sure most of you don't know him. But he is essentially father of biological valves. Uh, Dr. INSQ was uh, a chair of cardiac surgery in Leeds in England, and he designed the first pericardial valve ever to be implanted. And this was known as, you know, INSQ Shiley valve. So what he wrote this his, in his biography, this particular sentence has always struck me. If, the, in the, if there's an incense chamber, we also see both the things. What he meant by that was, whatever you do, biological valves are always going to degenerate. So based on the current prediction, if the towers are going to last for 10 years, and we know that the life expectancy in the United States is around 83, and maybe a slightly higher, seven to eight years more in Japan and Korea, we are going to get a lot of these patients back because they're going to outlive the valve. And hence, for the last two years especially, as you know, that Janner and few other people have really engaged into discussing and experimenting on what is actually suitable if we have to do a second tavern. So let's see where we are at present. If we want to do a reintervention on tavern, we need to have a good second intervention option. And I'm not saying intervention, just catheter intervention, but even surgery. The first of all, it should be low risk because that will be really good for the patient. We should have very good hemodynamic results because we should not have the same issues we have had in tower in cyber. We should maintain coronary access because the worst thing you can do is we can do the tab in tab and then have no coronary access or block the coronaries on the table. And more importantly, we always forget that patients choose biological valves because they don't want anticoagulation. If patients wanted anticoagulation, might as well put a you know a mechanism and get it done with. So we have essentially only two options, to be honest. We can either do tower in tower, or we can explant the tower and then see you know, how the patient does. And we still don't know the answer, in my opinion. I've been involved in both, and I still feel very strongly we have a really long way to go to understand and then have a very good guidance in terms of which patient should have it and which patient should have this treatment. So let's look at tower in tower. Again, let's keep in mind we want its low risk, good hemodynamics, maintain coronary access, and no anticoagulation. Now, first of all, is this really a good strategy for low risk patients? And I think this is, again, we will learn as we go more. As I said, this is a very young topic in terms of experience. If you talk in many centers, like how many actually they have done, most have done less than 20 per center. Most of the operators have not even engaged in analysis of, you know, 50 cases of such, you know, unique thing. So very few cases, a lot of these patients in the early experience as expected were elderly patients, high risk. Uh, there was, of course, you know, there will be a risk of valve thrombosis. Heart, as you know, is commonly occurs in all biological valves. 
there will be need for anticoagulation. And in our center, we have done now 12 cases. Then all these patients are on anticoagulation because all of these patients at one month get a CT scan. And we have found that there is a signal in terms of heart in most of these patients. And we'll again come back to that why it happens. But more critical part is hemodynamics. Hemodynamics are really important. You know, we should not just focus on acute results anymore. It's very important that we, when we choose a combination, we should know, we should feel confident that this is going to be a good second option and will last at least for five years, if not more. And more critical thing is most of these valves are non-fracturable because they're made of actually stent, which you can't fracture. You can expand them a bit, but I think fracturability is not just possible in the current designs. So this is just a patient from my center. This is a 90-year-old patient who has normal coronaries. And uh, as you can see here, for some strange reason, uh, she had a you know old core valve, and then we are putting another evolutar. Now, I, I don't know how many of you have seen the publication recently, which I'm going to talk about later. Uh, this is probably not a very smart decision when we are we can't align the commissures and we can actually get the whole thing covered. Why here in this patient we got away and ignorance is bliss. And in this is a 90 year old patient, this was perfectly acceptable. But if you look at the redo tower registry, you know, there are some signals, although again, early experience, that a lot of these patients don't do very well in terms of acceptable second option. Uh, this is a great registry which has been put by Yuri Landis. You can see that um, there are patients, you know, um, who have both core valve as well as sapien valve. Uh, this is essentially the split. And I'm not talking about patients who fail on the table for whatever reason, uh, but at least a stage procedure, which is either less than one year or more than one year. And again, what is more critical is, uh, you know, what these valves are. So. 39% were balloon expandable valves. And you can see interestingly that they have been treated with both balloon and self expandable valve. I think this is a very smart choice because balloon expandable valves are short profile and they can give you a much better option in terms of second treatment. Self expandable valves, majority of them other than Centera, which was uh, uh, made by Edwards, are essentially very tall devices. And here, interestingly, a lot of them have been treated with another self-expandable, which today Medtronic doesn't recommend at all. I think what is critical to understand is this algorithm has come from a day-to-day -day common sense practice. Now, as we are learning more, I think we are going to use the second valve choice, which is correct for each valve. And I'm going to talk about that as well. Uh, interestingly, if you look at the sizing, a uh, majority of the patients, uh, thankfully, had relatively decent size valve. That means most of them had either 36, 36 patients at 23, 46 at 26, and 35 patients at 29. So at least from sizing point of view, we are doing a fair justice to this topic because we are not implanting size 20 valves in all these patients. And overall, I think, you know, sure, I mean, this is, again, early experience, very high-risk patients. I would say these are acceptable results. And again, in terms of gradients, again, on table, of course, at the time of discharge and 30 days, we have decent gradients. If you look at the matrix of complications, however, a lot of patients had aortic regurg, and this could be in between the valves or existing paravalve leak. Uh, this problem is not going to exist in maybe newer designs because we don't get PV leak that much because of the PV leak skirt. But I think high residual gradient uh, is going to be an issue. And again, the reason for that is when we implant a tower device, it's never fully expanded as in the bench. And, you know, Janet has showed you probably the brilliant experiments he has done for a long time now. We never see that in the human body. And as you know, Mio Fukui, who is our research um, uh, fellow, she has recently published tower deformation papers as well as deformation after valve in valve. And I think we have learned a lot from that, that no valve is fully expanded. And all the valves, 99.9% .9 are under expanded in the human anatomy. Now again, I think it won't be uncommon to see high residual gradients. We have to, of course, walk.
watch them. We don't want patient to live with, you know, 20 plus gradients for a long time. And this is to do with, not to do with the heart, but it is to do with expansion of the second tower. So we are going to learn a lot about this topic, but essentially early experience, high-risk patients, completely acceptable. I think these patients didn't have another option. A lot of them were re-ops. So again, the redo surgery was not possible. Uh, there has been some attempt to do propensity matching to see how it compares with our TAV and SAV experience. And again, you know, propensity matching showed that it is actually slightly better than our TAV and SAV experience. Uh, but essentially, this shows the mortality curves at, uh, you know, 12 months or to one year. And this shows that in early experience, it is actually comparable. So it's all great. But to be honest, if you ask me, is this a good conclusion? So Tavar in Tavar appears to be safe. So should we, when patients come to us who actually rely on us to make a good judgment, this is not a full story at all. And again, another of my second favorite quotes is, I like this, torture numbers, they will confess to everything. Propensity matching, bootleg analysis, uh, this, that, it is to favor something. We never do analysis to show that our hypothesis is bad. We actually always do analysis to show our hypothesis is correct. So I think all I'm saying is that if you do, if you look into it a bit in detail, different picture starts emerging. And actually, I think having indulged in, you know, Val in Val for too long in my life, that Tower in Tower is going to be an fine art. You know, we have to maintain coronary perfusion. We have to maintain future coronary access. We have to avoid PPM. And more importantly, landing zone of the tower is pretty long and different in every patient. And I think this is going to be an art instead of just a science. What I mean by that is we will have to consider all these steps in each and every patient and not do or select a patient blindly because I've done last 50 successful. So on 51st patient, I'm going to be successful as well. So these are multiple questions which should come in your mind, not only access of coronary, but which second tower I should use, what is the hemodynamic I'm going to expect. And I'm just going to show you, all of you have already seen and done many times, you know, TAV in SAV. You know, when I started working on the so-called app, before app, I had collected a lot of information in, and people used to email me saying, Winnie, which valve we should use, etc. One thing I found strange was all valves are circular. They Most of them have same profile. Now, leaflet overhang is not an issue because majority of our tower devices are longer, or sure, taller, I mean. Uh, new annulus I defined was at the sewing ring, so we know exactly where we anchor. And we measured the ID there, so we know the dimensions as well. And coronary obstruction risk, thanks to Danny Davir and all the team, we use the VTC distance as a guidance and it has worked very well. But in tower in tower, first of all, as I mentioned, they necessarily don't expand fully. The profiles are different. There are shorter devices, intermediate size devices, and tall devices. Leaflet overhang is going to be variable and dependent on the wall design. But more importantly, the depth of implant is going to affect all these things in different proportions. And I think this has been the main big problem in terms of what we should do, uh, algorithm can be developed in analysis. And I'm just going to show you what I mean by that. So I think the three important considerations when we do this are going to be, what is the native anatomy? What's the first tower design and what has happened to it? And most importantly, what is the second tower we are going to choose? And a lot of these new terminologies are going to be used commonly now in our practice, such as neoskirt, VTC plane, risk plane, leaflet overhang, VTA distance, VTSTJ. Essentially, this is all focused on coronary obstruction. And the more I dive into this topic, I realize that the main issue, if at all going to be here, is coronary perfusion. And I think a lot of work has gone into that. So let's look at certain comp uh, combinations. So first of all, just looking at this picture, we realize that this is not like TAV in SAV. Uh, TAV in uh, you know, beast. Someone said not just...
So Vinny, we just kind of lost you. You froze on us. Um, okay, let's give Dr. Bappet a second. He may just need to rejoin. Uh, Vinny, you're on mute. There we go. I think something happened to the connection. Yeah, something happened to the connection, but you were right over here yep. when you froze, so it's all good. Yep. So, uh, you know, in a in lot of the things I've learned from last one year of indulging in this topic is, you know, short walls, you can generally use all the, all the devices. You can use short devices, tall devices. If you have tall walls, which are going to be supra annular, majority of the time we are only going to land up using short devices. What I'm talking of is mainly accurate as well as Evoluta. And if we have intraannular devices like Portico, I think you can treat them like sapien in some ways. Only thing is their leaflets are slightly taller. But I think, again, this is very critical. We are also learning that if your second wall is a balloon expandable wall, you can actually increase the dimensions. And if it's a self-expandable wall, they, it will conform in terms of the perimeter. So if there is a high risk in coronary obstruction, it may be prudent to choose a self-expandable wall to eliminate or reduce the risk of coronary obstruction. Um, I'm just going to show you a couple of you know, slides in terms of how these things will may play out. Uh, we are working for last four weeks very intensely in terms of developing a tab in tab app. And we have R&D meetings with each of the industry every week. Uh, we have really a good group of people. We have internal city analysis on large scale as well. And I can tell you, this is going to be a fun topic to you know put it in an app because unlike the wall in wall apps where we give you all the dimensions, everything here, you will be using the app along with analysis of a, you know you using some software because each patient is going to be different. So let's look at these four valves which we commonly use: uh, Sapien three, Navitor, uh, Accurate, and uh, Evolutar. And essentially, just let's think of you know implanting a Sapien. If if I'm going to implant the Sapien like this. You know, you can see the leaflet overhang is going to be different in each of these. So from sapien and portico, maybe not significant. Uh, but if I implant at this depth in accurate as well as evolutar, uh, there's going to be a significant leaflet overhang. Now, I may implant it like this. Then this is the line where I should measure it. And in terms of if I'm going to use the second wall, which is sapien, I will use area at this red line level a red zone level. If I'm going to use Evolutar, I'm going to use perimeter. So again, going to be some variation in terms of what we use. But what is interesting now is this is actually the ideal position for each wall. That means I don't want any leaflet overhang now. And so where do I measure it now? It's going to be actually at very different levels. And these are non-standardized you know, measurements because every patient is going to be very different. But the moment you move the wall up, the risk of coronary obstruction, especially with Evolutar, goes very high. So again, we will have to choose, I think, uh, something in the middle. That means where you have good hemodynamics with minimum leaflet overhang and no risk of coronary obstruction. So again, this is to show you why each patient may be different. So for example, in the earlier slide, I showed you this is ideal, but you know, the combination of sapien evolutar at a high risk of coronary obstruction. But to be honest, if the evolutar has been implanted deeper, then the obstruction risk is not that much. So we will have to correlate all this in each and every patient separately. And that's what I'm getting at. So I think this is what we are going to look at every patient we are analyze is what is the best compromise in terms of no leaflet overhang and good access to coronaries for future and no risk of coronary obstruction on the table. And this really all depends on all these things. Now, uh, this is Janus, I think, uh, video. As you see uh, here, he shows that the leaflet overhang really doesn't matter for opening or closing. However, these are normal leaflets. Uh, these are not stenosed leaflets. So if these top leaflets are stenosed, 
I am yet not sure how they are going to behave. They may actually favor it because they are not that loose, so they may not interfere with closure of the sapien, but they may not expand fully or get you know stretched out fully, and they might actually interfere. So there's yet I think a lot to learn uh, from this data as well. What really matters is when you implant these valves, the green is the geometric opening area of the sapien, and the yellow is you know the geometric opening area of the leaflet overhang. If the yellow areas are larger than the green, then I don't think it really matters. But if any of these yellow areas are short, smaller than the green, then I think hemodynamically, it's not going to be a good combination. So I think we still need to watch very carefully, especially this combination of sapien and evolutar. Now, Metronic recommends very strongly that we should implant it at node four or node five only. Uh, I'm yet to see the data from lab to say that the yellow area, which is the top area of the leaflet overhang is greater than the green area uh, for each wall combination. And we are currently, you know, every week, as I said, we are meetings with them and we'll find out soon about all this. So I'm just going to show you where all this comes from. Now, in early days, especially, I think, Azim, you will remember, you know, we are implanting Sapien first generation, Sapien XT 5050. And core valve, when we started, there was no recapturability. And a lot of these valves with the fear of embolization were implanted deeper. So when we did a tower in tower in these kind of cases with Sapien or another Evolute, we got away with it. Uh, this is, again, one of our cases from Abbott Northwestern. This is the first generation Sapien. And you can see, you know, the right and left are way above the tower because this tower has been implanted so deep. Um, but you can see the tower deformation in this patient as well. This is a balloon expandable valve, so it has expanded quite well. Uh, but this is Sapien 23. Uh, it had expanded to only 21. Uh, we chose uh, Evolutar in this particular patient, and you can appreciate how deep this valve was. This wall worked quite well for six, seven years in this particular patient. So she had the second Evolutar and she is, you know, doing quite well. So this patient recently had an echo and her gradient is now, you know, 26. So again, this gradient is slowly going up and this is her post-implant tower CT. You can see there are two devices and if we cut them at various level, uh, you see that at the functioning portion, which is the middle panel, uh, you can see how deformed the Evolutar is. It's not exactly circular in shape. So I think we would expect this issue. Now, maybe in future, you know, as we are doing more cases, we'll probably balloon dilate and make sure our implantation zone uh, is nice and circular, and which I think is going to give us lower gradients and less risk of fault in future. But with tower taller devices now, and this is a, another patient of mine. Uh, here you can see, uh, you know, Evolute Pro 29, uh, nearly, you know, zone zero implantation, pretty high. And for whatever reason, three years later or less than that, this patient came back with stenosis. Uh, we are implant, trying to implant uh, Sapien in around zone four, node four, node five. Uh, well expanded valve, and you can Okay, I guess there's clearly a problem in Minneapolis today with the internet. Let's see if we get Dr. Bapa back. Benny, what's happening in Minneapolis today? I can't hear you, Benny. Yeah. I think uh, the hospital wants to sabotage my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> they want you. They want you to go to work. <laughs> but <laughs> start operating. I think they heard about Northwestern case, and now <laughs> this case. This case is very very interesting because I think some of you have probably spotted there is a venous cannula in uh, right atrium, and what had happened in this patient is although the right artery was non-dominant and I'm going to play this here um, there was an issue and this patient already had a high LVDP uh, on the CT analysis we felt we might block the right and uh, not good options for the right 
So we electively had put this patient on ECMO and then we did the case. She needed around 30 minutes of ECMO and we weaned her off uh, because as you can see here again, uh, the coronary perfusion kind of is maintained in the right. It was impossible to cannulate the left and the right in this particular patient. So I think uh, in future, this is going to be a problem for sure. So we are working on this now. And what we have done is we are trying to develop a relatively uniform, easy to understand uh, pathway for all of us to analyze each combination. That means if you have first valve, which is accurate, which has failed, what is step-by-step step you should analyze on three menses circle or a similar software and get all the information which is needed so that you can choose one, the right type of second valve. You can also assess the coronary risk. And more importantly, you precisely know where to implant the valve as well. Because unlike the SAVR, you know, the implantation zone is going to change from case to case. And this is a really difficult topic uh, in terms of putting it concisely into anything. And uh, we are making every effort to do this. And I'm quite confident in a month's time, uh, we will have a very good structure in terms of beta testing and release of the app around TVT. Um, so again, one of the common terms, uh, this is just towards the end now, is risk plane. We are going to see uh, this term being used quite a lot. I personally don't understand exactly many times, you know, risk plane, risk for what, right? A risk for coronary obstruction or risk for leaflet overhang or risk for bad result. So I think risk plane has been used commonly just to alert you mainly to do with coronary obstruction. Uh, but unfortunately, if you lower the risk plane, uh, for example, in Evolutar, if you implant it at node three, it's not going to touch the top wall at all. So you can lower the risk plane, but have uh, no meaning to your procedure. So I think we need to define some of these terms again, especially when we are giving step-by-step -step, you know, analysis guidance to the, uh, to the users. Uh, very quickly, I think uh, surgical uh, tower explant has been used quite commonly. Uh, if, if it's a short while, I always say, you know, be careful. These valves don't just pull out. You have to crush the valve flared. So it's very important, especially in sapient lotus and direct flow. Mitral valve is very near. I have seen experienced surgeons making perforation of the anterior leaflet and conduction tissue. Again, you have to be very gentle with that. Otherwise, you increase the risk of pacemaker. So this is just one of the short videos. Uh, this is the sapient being explanted. Uh, this is a technique, we'll say, in terms of, you know, taking it out. So in this particular technique, I'm just going to forward it a bit. Uh, the surgeon is cutting the stent in the middle. And uh, this is a good technique. And what you do is once you cut the sapien, you just roll it and disengage it from the native annulus. So it's not difficult, but with, with patience, it takes around five minutes to 10 minutes. Uh, if you do it quickly, you're going to damage something. And I think here, I'm just showing that even balloon expandable valves, which are short, uh, are very hard to take out. Uh, you can see the amount of panels. And I think with most of these valves get skirts now, especially the sapien ultra skirt, uh, having implanted some sutureless valves, we stuck to the anatomy. So is going to be very, very tricky. Uh, once we do that, we just cut all the leaflets, we nibble it down and do a surgical valve. Um, this is, I call it a crocodile roll. Uh, this is another technique, uh, very quickly again, for the lack of time. Uh, what we do is we cut the stent and rather than going each way, we cut the native leaflets outside, if you can find a plane. And then after cutting those leaflets, just keep rolling on the two strong needle holders and then the valve comes out. Uh, some people call it a mustache roll. Um, and I think you can see it here, you know, the valve will come out again nicely. Uh, this is how sometimes we remove, especially in acute implantation, you just keep compressing it in the center, 
make it smaller and smaller and smaller, deform it and then take it out. Uh, direct flow, some of you probably don't know. Azim and me, for sure, we know this valve very well. Uh, we implanted this valves uh, in not that many numbers, uh, but this was a device which was repositionable. This was a beautiful technology for that time. And then once you are in good position, you inject a polymer in both those rings, which will stabilize the valve. Now, as you can see from the design, the true idea, oh, this is one of the patients from uh, Munich. This is uh, done by one of my close friends. And he sent me this picture, uh, you know, how this looks like. And they initially thought they can get away with a 23 volute R, but it was too small. But more critically, it was, this is how we took it out. He had to nibble it out, literally. It was extremely hard. If you can see here, it was so embedded in the anatomy that it was really hard to take it out. So I think we are going to struggle a bit when some of the Lotus devices or other devices like this come back. Hi, Vinny. I'm sorry about that. I'm not sure what we can do to make it better. By now, yeah. It's okay. Uh, you're, by now, you're getting the interruptions. I apologize. <laughs> no, it's Next fine. time, it's from my office. <laughs> um, this, is, this is really important, um, is uh, how do you take a tall device? And you can see this is a Evolute R after around two and a half years. Uh, my chief resident in Colombia is doing this procedure. Uh, I am helping him. So I always tell surgeons, Look at the LVOT first, uh, so we understand the depth of implant. Is it close to the mitral valve? Is it close to the conduction tissue? Uh, don't just start explanting the valve. And then slowly divide the plane. Uh, I did a live case two TCTs ago. Uh, that's another good case to look at as a reference in terms of, uh, you know, how do you dissect this without damaging the aorta? There are multiple techniques of doing this, but... Essentially, it's like endarterectomy. Uh, you use a nice spatula. Don't use forceps like Ben is doing here. So I had to tell him uh, just to stop. And then essentially, we use the spatula, which is used for endarterectomy. And the beauty of this nitinol stent is you can bend it inwards. And it's really nice to do this dissection. It takes around 10 minutes. Uh, first is to remove the outflow portion of Evoludar. And I think similar technique has been applied to Portico as well. Uh, so take your time, remove it. People think cold slush makes it easier. I actually have not found it. But, you know, some people say you can compress it. It's not that easy. Uh, but you can definitely bend it inwards and uh, not dissect the aorta outwards. And you can see that with the spatula, uh, the top portion starts compressing inside. Uh, once we do that, then we come to the inflow portion because the middle portion is never in contact with anything. And then we develop a plane between the native leaflets and the stent of the evolutar or core valve. And again, uh, it's remarkable how well fixated it is in the annulus, despite being so delicate and compressible. Uh, this is just to suck some debris. And then here now, Ben is developing a plane between the native leaflets, which are, he's holding with the forceps. And again, push the stent inside. If you keep pushing outside, that means that is the time when you can damage the mitral leaflet or conduction tissue or any subannular structure. And here, after doing that, you can see that uh, he's beautifully taking it out. And then I like this technique because it's under control rather than, you know, we have also demonstrated a technique where you put four sutures at the top and try to snare the wall in a tube. Uh, to be honest, it takes a lot of force to snare it inside. So this is a very elegant technique to do as well. It takes, you know, five minutes more maybe. Uh, but here is the conduction tissue. Again, we are taking our time. And this is where the mitral leaflet is. 
And as you can see, once it starts collapsing, it's very, very simple to take this wall out. And uh, native leaflets, you can see, are fully open. And uh, despite just two years here, you can see the amount of beautiful pseudo-endothelialization or panels, you want to call it, inside and outside the stent frame. So our experience with tower explant has been as good or bad as the early tower in tower. As, we, as you know, we have a tower explant registry now. Uh, the registry has now published you know, a decent amount of results. Uh, there are a lot of publications from centers like Michigan as well as Cleveland Clinic and Germany. Uh, but essentially, when we analyze this, these results, uh, the, interestingly, the split was 50-50 in terms of explant as well. And a lot of these patients were reoperated for endocarditis and structure was, I think, concomitant rather than just a, a, a primary indication. And a lot of these patients were urgent. Uh, as expected, you know, overall survival in these patients was uh, not that spectacular. Uh, you have to also remember that a lot of these patients were excluded for tavern in tavern as well. So most of the centers, as you know, is in my center here. If it's an elderly patient, we want to see if tab in tab is pop, then we definitely consider tower explant. So again, a lot of these patients could be, you know, on that uh, cusp of uh, extreme risk as well. So the main question today is for all of us is, you know, forget the high risk and all because we are in 2023 now. And uh, can we really do this in low risk patients? Um, will it increase the risk of coronary obstruction or future access? More importantly, in my mind, as from our own experience, most patients need anticoagulation. And again, what is the longevity of these combinations? And the reason I insist on longevity is this just this paper has been released uh, on Twitter at least yesterday. Uh, this was forwarded by to uh, me by my fellow. And this is the study which shows, this is pretty glaring, isn't it? That if you are using, you know, a sapient evolute in evolute, uh, 20, only 29% of patients may be suitable for it in terms of risk of coronary obstruction. Uh, if you are using sapient 3, if you want to reach that 80%, is going to be evolute, you know, node 4, uh, with a decent amount of leaflet overhang and I want to drag you back to that yellow and green circle. I think we need to make sure that, that the yellow circle at the top of leaflet overhang, the opening of the leaflet overhang is adequate than the green circle of the sapien wall we are going to use. So, and how long this is going to last. So there are going to be a lot of layers. I think just uh, extrapolation, the sizing, etc. A lot of other questions which still need to be answered. So I feel that this only tells us a partial story. This doesn't tell us a complete story. So to conclude, I think tower for failure, definitely we are going to see like cyber failures. Uh, very good uh, hard team discussion, but more important I think is learning good analysis of CT on each individual basis, especially is going to be critical for tab and tab. And if you are contemplating explant, then I think we need to understand the design interaction with the native anatomy so that most of these patients, you can just do a AVR rather than a root replacement or a AVR with a sending replacement. Uh, thank you very much. Very, <clears throat> as expected, that was uh, really spectacular. Thank you so much um, for, um, for that amazing talk. If you have a few minutes, we'd love to have a little bit of discussion with you. I'm just trying to bring all the fellows on as well. Um, ah, and, and then put your valve and your new app on, PPM. Just I want to make sure everybody knows. So those of you who really haven't seen uh, you know, the new app that comes from Dr. Bapet, uh, it's the patient procedures mismatch app. And I we've been using it when we look at patients, particularly patients with small annuli to decide which valve we're going to give them um, and what their risk of patient prosthesis mismatch is. It really is an excellent app for those of you who don't know, because most people know they're orticomitral. This is new and, and very worthwhile getting. Yeah. Um, so, Vinny, um, yeah, 
let's start with the fellows, then maybe I, I will have some questions at the end. We still have a couple of minutes, but I see Samina on. Um, sure. Let's start with her. Thank Samina, you so much. Amazing talk. It was amazing. Um, my question is about small analysts. I was thinking, like, you know, reflecting on this great talk, when you have a patient uh, with low risk profile, like lower risk surgical patients, they come and they have this small anatomy. What would be your first approach for these patients if you're in a center that you have access to root enlargement and uh, SABR versus like TAVR, obviously? Yeah, yeah. I think, Zamina, that's a really good question. So I'm going to self-criticize myself a bit. Uh, you know, when we say root enlargement, you know, the uh, percentage of root enlargement done in the country are pretty small. A lot of surgeons are not yet experienced in doing a robust and, uh, you know, good root enlargement. So root enlargement is a procedure I think is really needed in only around 10% of patients. So small annuli, absolutely. But more critically, Samina, for many years, I've been saying that we should be sizing surgical valves from CT scan. And when I moved to Abbott Northwestern now, we have prospectively applied that. For example, if a patient, say, gets a CT scan in Montefiore today, that patient goes anywhere in the world, they are going to get the same size sapien and same size evolutar. I think we agree with that, right? Mm -hmm. But if they go to five different centers in New York or five different surgeons, there's a chance that they will get a different size label valve. And so we found at Abbott Northwestern that by just giving surgeons a clear guidance, and we have applied, we have, it's in publication now, that for this annular size, you use this size Inspiris and this size Onyx. You know, we have eliminated the need for root enlargement in majority of the patient. But absolutely, I think if it's a small annulus, root enlargement is a really good option, but then we need to plan it before and send it to a surgeon uh, who, you know, he or she is comfortable to do it. And I think that's a really uh, good point. Vinny, maybe just exploring that. I mean, how, do, why are so many surgeons reluctant to do it? Is it a, technically difficult? Is it associated with complications? Does it prolong the surgery su substantially? No, I think uh, the root enlargement, <clears throat> the main thing is it changes the orientation of the root. So you need to learn it from somebody, right? Who has done it before. And uh, <clears throat> the second thing is the risk of bleeding. Because when you put a patch, essentially you put the valve halfway into the patch. So if there's a bleeding from below, it is it's a it becomes a really tough job. So the way to do it, and you know, I've hired now five young surgeons. Uh, we scrub with them, the two senior surgeons with them. So, but we identify the patients before because we use a CT algorithm. So, if that patient needs a root enlargement, you know, one of us scrubs with them and we have taken them through. Only one surgeon at present is still learning, but all other surgeons do it on their own now. Okay, great. Um, Andrea? Yes, thank you for this great talk. I, <clears throat> I'm thinking about your Tavin Tavi app. I guess there are many, many challenges in developing this solution. And many patients will have a high risk of coronary obstruction. So I guess probably surgery will be an option for these patients. Um, what do you think about, uh, or at least in the future, the role of um, cutting or removing leaflets? Uh, so new technologies or new valves, will they play an important role in the future? Absolutely. I think leaflet modification, uh, you know, at present we see in a basic form in terms of making a split in the middle. Uh, but I think we are going to definitely need, you know, uh, much more advanced leaflet modification, whether it's a <clears throat> complete removal of the leaflets or whatever that could be. You know, it comes with its own challenges, right? Because there are valves now which uh, are two-stage valves where they have been tried. <clears throat> but the acute AR, how do we manage it, etc. And, you know, I think this field is going to evolve quite nicely. Uh, but let's not lose the sight of it as well, because we can keep doing some advanced things 
to do some simple procedure, then it's probably not very good. That means if removal of leaflet is going to be very challenging and while doing a tab and tab is so simple, right? So we should not expose patients to something without understanding the cumulative risk. And I think that is why I feel strongly that there's a lot of effort from surgical community as well to teach younger, you know, surgeon, any surgeon, not young or old, but anybody about tower explants as well. So we share it very openly, our own complications like, uh, you know, damage to anterior leaflet, what are the different techniques of, ex, ex, you know, warning people in terms of, you know, what challenges they can have and not give a message that, hey, tower explant is very easy, you know, it just takes 10 minutes. It's not <laughs> like that. So I think we have to do the same thing when we are doing these leaflet modifications and understand, is it good enough for the low risk patient? I think my question is, the second intervention has to be good enough for a low risk patient. That's all. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you. Willem? Hi. Very, thank you for your very precise talk and principle, and we really appreciate the quotes. <laughs> uh, based on your perspective, um, do you think that valve thrombosis is, could be an indicator of uh, future dysfunction? And what do you think of the specific case of reductavi? Do you think we expect the uh, same durability or maybe less? Well, thank you. So it's very interesting that uh, um, you know you raised this question because I don't know the answer myself, uh, but I would encourage all of you to read uh, Miho's article on wall deformation. Uh, I think the deformation of the second wall is going to be more. I showed you some of the CT panels, which he really works on very well. Uh, I think we need to understand all that. And uh, yesterday we sat down, we have done an analysis of 200 patients of uh, Sapien now. And what we find is even Sapien, you know, it's never fully expanded. And so we are always going to undersize these valves. And Sapien is good valve because at least it circularizes in most anatomies. But, you know, self-expanding valves don't circularize properly. So I, I think there are a lot of challenges still in understanding the durability of the combination uh, of TAM and TAV means I I don't want to sound skeptical, but I think we still need to explore it and then revisit it again. So that's definitely one challenge. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think we, we won't know until we, we have more data, but I like you, Vinny, I was just looking at your CT scans as well and with the deformation and the, you know, the, the quality of the CT scans are so great. I'm sorry, can... my internet is not great. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I was just saying with some of your CD scans you showed us, you can actually really almost see the pinwheeling of the leaflets, you know, um, from them from that compression. Yeah. So I think we're going to learn a lot as we do this, as we continue moving forward. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, as I said earlier, Azim, most of our patients are on anticoagulation. Uh, we have Uh, Vinny, I think we lost you again. I found very yeah. similar thing on my mitral wall in wall as well. Patients, majority of the patients early signal symptoms. So I think doing a post implant CT sooner or later is going to be like a mandatory thing in all yeah. all the patients. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Uh, uh, it's going to be quite important. Well, let's let Dr. Um, Bapad go. So maybe Julio, last question, and then we're going to move on. Matteo, did you have a pressing question, or are you good? Let's start with Julio. Uh, hello, Dr. Bapat. Uh, congratulations, um, and thank you for this wonderful and amazing talk. I have two uh, very quick questions. The first one, when you have a specific setting, specific situation at the end of the procedure, uh, when we have a low flow in the neosinus, is there any consideration for anticoagulation to prevent coronary obstruction? And the second one, 
is uh, uh, we read with uh, great enthusiasm. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Your the answer is yes. Okay. As I okay. said, you know, um, all the small wall in wall, even tower in cyber, we used to always anticoagulate. Okay, thank you so much. And the second, we read your paper that was published in, in March in YAC, the, the formation of THV after valve valve-taver in 53 patients with the implanters uh, evolute, uh, and you did a, a really a great job. And the main conclusion of this uh, paper was like uh, uh, under expansion only in the functional part, nor in the inflow brain or the overall uh, brain. My was apologies, really I couldn't hear the whole question. I think it's because of the unstable. Sorry, sorry. I can repeat uh, without problems for sure. Uh, we read the, your paper of the formation of THV after buff in valve tavern. Yep. And my question is, do we have data about uh, which are the uh, thermodynamic outcomes in patients with red tavern if uh, we have uh, uh, worse outcomes if the under expulsion is in the inflow frame, in the functional part of the overflow frame? Thank yeah, you. that's a great question. So what we have learned now with the self-expandable valve mainly that we have to optimize the middle portion. Uh, the inflow doesn't matter, outflow doesn't matter. It's the middle portion. So I think if we optimize the middle portion, uh, your hemodynamics are going to be better. And I think we are slowly doing that in our practice now. Uh, you don't need to use a true balloon to do that because it, there's a risk that it will damage the new evolutar leaflets. But I think you are absolutely spot on with the wall in wall deformation after uh, TAV in SAV uh, for aortic. Uh, we definitely have seen that. And I think it's going to be really critical in future that we start optimizing things on the table because, you know, we generally, early days, right, we did the procedure because this was high-risk procedures. And thank God patient is alive, you know, was great result, actually. Not good result, it was great. But now we are promising patients that we will do a biological wall as a surgeon and then we are going to do a wall in wall. But I think we need to optimize the procedure so they get at least seven to eight years benefit. So the answer is to your question is yes. Anticoagulation, if there is a stasis in the sinus and uh, optimizing the valve shape. So we always see it in two coplanar views to understand as it, you know, uh, inflated as good as it is possible. Great. So maybe really last question, Matteo. Uh, and then we let Dr. Bapad go to his surgery. I see there are some other questions on the chat um Gali, maybe I can talk to you afterwards and go through some of the answers. Uh, I'm not sure who the other person is, but I'm happy to to answer those for you afterwards. Um, Vinny, um, Matteo, last Thank question, you. short. It's a very excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is actually just kind of touched upon. It's kind of about how you um, how we should approach our patients now with new valves and new implantation techniques, so that maybe in the future our our tab and tab is, is easier. I think, very, yeah, I think so I think, yeah. yeah. So Im implantation is a, you know, it's a very interesting problem with tab and tab because, um, you know, it, first of all, it, a lot of things depend upon how deep the first wall is and where it is and how deformed it is, what we measure, the height of the second wall. So you are right. I think, you know, we are going to, and I keep saying we are going to learn a lot, but I think some pattern is emerging now with not just the cases, but the CT analysis and simulations we are running. Uh, I think we should be able to guide everybody in terms of if you have a patient, step by step, you do this, 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 then you, you can select a particular second valve. Then you confirm the size because a lot of sizing recommendation is based on simulation. But we know that in patient, it never expands fully. Actually, the case I showed you, which was we did the sapien in Evolutar, uh, it was an Evolut Pro 29, and we used a 23S3. Bench testing shows we should use a 26, but we actually used a 23 because the area was very small at the landing zone. So we are going to learn, not just learn, we are going to give people a step-by-step, -step, and if you need to change the size, you need to reanalyze the coronary obstruction risk. I think. 
it's like a chicken and egg every time. So it's going to be looping back and forth till you settle down on the combination risk of coronary and then the landing zone. And then you should try and precisely land it where you want to land it. It's going to be quite tricky, to be honest. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. Many, uh, thank you so much. And, uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, I just want to... I just want to answer Carly's third question. Yeah. Uh, Carly, you. it is non fractured valves. And I think you are right. So, Hancock 2 and Mosaic, uh, you know, you should try and use a true balloon because it molds from inside. Uh, we have done, you know, animal data, dilatation, and CT scans to show that. And the second thing is if you use Evolutar, you should dilate the middle portion of the evolutar. So you're not modifying surgical valve, but you're modifying the tower device. Uh, yeah. And I think you will get much better hemodynamics. That's a, that's a great, su that's thank a great you. suggestion about the, the middle part of the, of the evolute. But you, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. I am going to beg you to come back so we can talk about Mac in the future uh, and help us with that. Cause we are really struggling. Uh, we have a lot of Mac patients, as you know, you're in New York and, particularly here in the Bronx. So we'd love to have your expertise. Uh, have a great day. I'll see you later this week. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And Bye -bye. I'll definitely join with a better internet connection next time. <laughs> <laughs> have a good